So um, I'm I'm sure it was uh, a lovely introduction. I thank you for that. Um, I'm just not hearing anything on the uh, uh, on the Zoom. It, Start us as the transition was no, was made to you know, having your Jen is telling me she has a problem too, but I'm assuming people can hear me, so I'm gonna can go ahead and you. Uh, just can also ask see you, David. you to come into. You're. I didn't hear what he said. He said we can also see you. Oh, okay, uh, good. Then I'll try not to do anything to embarrass myself. So uh, Bob uh, was asking me, uh, we do have, uh, we'll have a brief in, uh, encounter for, with a message from uh, uh, Bill McGibbon, I believe later in, is, uh, uh, so I was, it, it was suggested I split my, um, uh, my conversation into two topics. One is a reflection on the challenge of the climate change and the environment from a religious standpoint. Um, and the second, a brief reflection on my work as the U.S. Ambassador for Inter International Religious Freedom, um, which was one of the blessings of my life in the, during the second term of the Obama administration. So let me begin with just some comments about uh, uh, the environmental crisis that we face. Um, I've often used that of all of the issues that we deal with, peace, justice, economic justice, legal justice, racism. I mean, all of them have profoundly religious um, uh, components to them and strike uh, uh, basic uh, religious values that are at stake. But there seems to me something special about the intuitive nat uh, religious nature of concern about God's creation that has been entrusted to us. And uh, I, it has struck me that while there is some wonderful work going on um, on the environment in the religious community, it is not in the last 30 years that I've been working on the issue, since the beginning of the 90s when we formed the National Religious Partnership on the Environment, uh, a coalition of the Catholic bishops and the National Council of Churches, the, uh, a uh, the, count, the Coalition on Environment and Jewish Life, a consortium of about 23 national Jewish organizations and evangelicals uh, for the environment, that it is never escalated to the kind of level of other public policy concerns that the religious community has. And that kind of has always struck me as, as uh, disappointing and challenging uh, for us. It isn't that anyone's opposed to it. It isn't that inherently um, uh, uh, the way that those institutions I name interpret the tradition. Um, uh, there is anything about creation or the story of creation um, uh, uh, that would lead us away from a sense of an obligation to care for God's uh, uh, creation. Um, it just is not leaped up uh, to the same level as core issues of economic justice and, and peace issues um, and conflict resolution issues and, and race issues have, uh, have sprung up. And needless to say, it is an enormously challenging one. Um, for those of you who were at the service where I spoke this morning, um, I really see uh, the uh, climate crisis as an existential crisis for humanity. And the fact that we continue to linger um, uh, is uh, locked in when warned to leave Sodom and in the face of the imminent instruction um, is a sad statement about the, uh, the state of world affairs. Um, so it, it, it is, it, there are, first of all, what we can do about it. Think about it for a moment. There are more churches synagogues, mosques, temples, than any other public institution in American life, and you know, far more than libraries, hospitals, schools, and firehouses probably combined. Uh, over 300,000 churches, synagogues, mosques, ashrams, temples in the United States, um, and millions of houses of worship. 
um, across the globe. Can you imagine if every one of them are engaged in a series to conserve energy, to go goods and recycle goods, to create community gardens, um, uh, to clean up uh, our neighborhoods, to plant trees, to speak out on environmental policy for our billions of uh, congregants. What a transformation of the environmental issue we would see. And as religious people, we now know why we must be involved. Let me just speak about that from a Jewish context and in Jewish terms, but I think every one of you, whatever your religious tradition, can translate the ideas I'm talking about into your own um, uh, concern. Uh, we read in the Bible, the earth is the eternals and the fullness their own. That what we own, we own in a trust relationship with God, requiring that we protect God's creation. The Jews, extensive arrays going back into the biblical times, but really uh, developed in the Talmudic era, that era when Jesus of Nazareth lived for the next 500 years um, uh, here, there were environmental regulations that, that keeping the water and the air clean, in preventing pollution and containing waste, encouraging under the rubric of what it says in Deuteronomy, Baal Tashkid, the conservation of resources, the requirement of migrash, belts of green, plant around urban areas. All of these testify to ancient obligations of religious people and Jews to address environmental uh, concerns. But hold on just one moment. Are we having a problem? Is that no, no, I don't think so, but no, I can just close it. Um, yeah. um, I don't think that's the cause, but we'll see. Let's cross up the fingers it is. Um, but the unprecedented urgency of today's crisis challenges our ability to apply those values, those traditions, to the world in which we dwell. A crisis whose complexity we see with every day, every year to see our planet home, the first to really see it. The picture of the whole earth taken from outer space is the defining image, the icon, the revelation of our generation. No other humans before us experience this phenomenon. We see it from afar, this blue-green home with its great forests and seas and mountains and creatures and from space, it is sweet and precious and good, the way God created and beheld the Kitov, and it was good. But just at the very moment in human history, we will see with wonder, with clarity and awe, how precious is God's creation. We are suddenly confronted by the startling evidence of its peril, of the damage already being wrought by our own hands, by our ignorance, by our indifference, by our greed, affecting all of us indiscriminately. Global warming, ozone depletion, the escalating eradication of entire species of life, the destruction of our rainforests, runaway world population, the population of the world doubled between the year one and the year 1200. The growth rate was at its peak in the late 1960s when the in, in late 1960, when the population was predicted to double in 40 years, but the impact of global economic growth, higher levels of education, particularly for girls, improved health care, as uneven as that has been across the globe, all served to greatly slow the rate of, uh, of growth in the population. In other words, we can do something if we act fast enough. Um, and this we know above all. If we do not, uh, if we do not act to ensure that this planet's climate, climate is not destroyed, there will be no Noah's Ark to protect any one of us, any group of us, and our, we're bound up with each other in the destiny of what happens with God's creation. Yet. As we will hear from Bill McKibben, numerous current studies show climate change advancing far, far faster than pessimists predicted even a decade ago. Scientists point to the melting polar ice cap, um, the rising sea levels, the increasing patterns of extreme weather, 
whole climate zones turn suddenly arid or flood prone. The, the floods that we saw in Pakistan that didn't make it really on uh, as lead stories on our newspapers are amongst the most devastating floods in human history. Um, uh, here, more intense hurricanes and forest fires. The great sequoias have lasted fires and hurricanes and floods for over 2,000 years, but this year they were imperiled as never before and some of them damaged as never before. The UN's uh, premier research arm, the IPCC, concluded that things are spinning out of control. It's now or never. Um, I give a lot of cre credit to Secretary General Guterres, who has been warning us over and over and over again, who has taken this up as one of the major priorities, recognizing that if we don't succeed in stopping this now, it will spin out of control. Um, and major cities are going to end up other, underwater. He, he said in a recent message, and he reiterated this at the, at the conference in, uh, in uh, Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, um, uh, he predicted that we're predicting now unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortages, the extinction of a million species of animals in, pl in plants in the coming few years. And this is not fiction, he said, or exaggeration is what science. For this earth is our God, but devastation, and that we cannot. We did were going on with um, uh, some remarks about the international religious freedom issue. If, if there is time for some questions or, um, or discussion um, uh, on the environmental issue, and if not, I can continue um, when we're ready to turn to the message from Bill McGibbon. <laughs> but I am not able to hear anything of what's being said now um, uh, since Mia finished her presentation. Yes, Rabbi Saperstein, I thought that was really Now I am hearing you. All right, and I think we almost got a second sermon in this package here, which is great. That was a fantastic uh, uh, theological reflection on the importance of the work you of saving this me to earth. talk about the religious stake, so I did my best on that. Yeah, you did. You did it excellent. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not seeing any questions just yet in, this, in the Q&A uh, box, uh, but uh, if you wouldn't mind going on to talk about some of your reflections on your religious and human rights work when you were U.S. ambassador. Sure, I, 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 I'd be glad to. But look, if we're going to address any of the issues we care about, so the climate change issue that I talked briefly about now, the um, and the and the religious obligation to address that, um, the address uh, the uh, proliferation and uh, edging towards a nuclear war that I talked about this morning, but any issues that adhere to any of our hearts here. And I know the wide range of issues I'm sure we share in common um, about racism, about sexism, about um, uh, uh, prejudice against people in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity on ethnic basis uh, here. And the fact that in the richest country in, in the world, um, we can have so many people uh, living in poverty here and that with all the advances we've made on a global level of really um, uh, uh, significantly cutting the number of people by uh, more than a couple of billion uh, from what it was in 1950 until uh, today, um, the population continues to grow and uh, those living the poorest of the poor really have not declined at the kind of number that we have. So we have all of these. But none of that will work if we don't have the freedom to follow our conscience 
in addressing these issues. And that depends on the plight of democracy, the plight of human rights, and the plight of religious freedom. Freedom House, which monitors the ebb and flow of democracy and human rights on the global level, tells us that from the end of World War II, from 1945 until 2006, while there was expansion during the time of the collapse of the Soviet um, uh, Union, the midpoint of that ebb and flow moved inexorably, or not wrong word to choose, move very clearly and powerfully in the direction of greater democracy and greater human rights until 2006. In 2006, that pattern began to reverse and has gone is consistently in the wrong direction as autocracies have pushed democratic um, uh, protections aside and challenge the rule of law and shut down the free press and uh, curtail the ability of people to protest um, uh, their governments for redress of uh, grievances. We've seen those, some of those reversals in our own country. We've seen it in countries that we care about because of our own ethnic identities um, uh, and have that it's special ties to. Um, and we've seen it on a, uh, on a powerful global level. Um, uh, particularly in some of the most populous countries on, uh, on Earth. It's interesting that Pew that follows uh, the patterns every year of religious freedom abuses uh, indicates that three quarters of all the countries in the world do not have serious restrictions on religious freedom. The problem is the countries that fit in the one quarter that do have serious challenges, either from governmental repression of religious freedom or from societal repression of religious uh, freedom, either countenanced by the government or with governments unable to curtail such societal um, uh, violence and attacks and repressive actions, um, uh, usually against religious minorities. Um, uh, here, but amongst those countries are China, India, Pakistan, Nigeria, some would put Indonesia, some wouldn't, but uh, a clearly populous um, uh, country. In other words, you have some of the most populous countries on the face, Russia definitely, um, you have some of the most populous countries on the face of the earth um, in which religious minorities or religious Sec, uh, minority sex within the majority religion face ongoing restrictions, ongoing excessive regulations, ongoing repression, um, uh, et cetera. We have tensions in America over how to balance out religious freedom claims against civil rights protections and civil rights claims. Uh, when people want to say they have religious claims not to obey laws that protect the LGBTQ community or protect minority religions that they don't like or protect women in ways that their religious faith says is wrong. We thought we had resolved that with Supreme Court rulings in the civil rights era saying that protection of civil rights is a sufficiently compelling interest that the government can restrict religious uh, freedom claims um, uh, from against participation in the protection of the rights of protected uh, groups. I pray for the day when internationally, that is the debate in every nation across the globe, how best to balance out religious freedom claims and civil rights claims. Because we're talking about millions, if not billions of people who suffer from repression and discrimination, who can be arrested for worshiping God the way they do, or for not believing in God and not worshiping God at all um, uh, here, who can be tortured in prison, who can be attacked in their houses of worship, um, who can be subject to ethnic cleansing like Rohingya Muslims um, uh, in, uh, in the face of militant Buddhists in, uh, in Myanmar, or Russia's uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, genocide against Tibetan Buddhists or physical genocide against the Uyghur um, uh, Muslims. Uh, this is a very challenging time and the intersection of the kind of democracy and human rights in general and the kind of religious freedom um, uh, in particular um, could not be clearer to us. Uh, and in every country where people cannot live um, their lives in accordance with their religious conscience openly, it drives religious practices and, and uh, communities 
underground, and they then become fertile field for extremists who say, you'll never get your freedom in the face of this kind of repression from the government. Work with us, we'll overthrow the government, and then you'll get greater freedom. Often the opposite is the result when uh, repressive governments are overthrown and other repressive regimes uh, come in and make things um, even worse. So this is a very dangerous moment in terms of religious freedom. I am proud of the fact that the United States took the initiative first amongst any nations on earth, uh, including any democratic nation, to really say that it's not enough that democracies are doing on behalf of religious freedom compared to its commitment to protect other human rights. Um, and human rights groups don't do enough to protect uh, religious uh, freedom. Uh, it led to the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act that created the, uh, uh, the watchdog uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom with nine very diverse people who have a common interest in the fight for international religious freedom. Um, and the U.S. Ambassador for Religious Freedom, it created the, US, the annual report on religious freedom. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, which is transform um, uh, the engagement of the international community. We now have contact groups on religious freedom. We have ministerial meetings regularly on religious freedom. We have the international summits on religious freedom. I just returned uh, two days ago from a religious freedom uh, uh, summit in the Muslim world that took place in Abu Dhabi. The UAE has been deeply committed to this. Uh, some of the countries that are supportive of this have their own problems about human rights um, and, uh, and uh, re uh, democratic repression. Um, but uh, many, both who embrace democracy and some who challenge democracy, um, seem to be working in ways that I want to address because they find out the infringement on religious freedom, because they're finding out that they're being victimized by some of the very extremists that they countenance and allow to happen. And every faith group has extremists. Whether we're talking about militant Buddhists in Myanmar, who ever thought we'd be talking about militant Buddhists? Or we're talking about extremist Jewish groups on the West Bank, or we're talking about extremist Christian groups in the United States of America that are the, um, the source of much of the violence from the right that is uh, taking place and wants in this Christian nationalist approach to severely limit our democratic norms and abandon our democratic norms um, in America. Or we're talking about uh, fund uh, extremist Hindus in India that are making life miserable for growing number of segments of uh, the Muslim community, particularly better in the South, but in the North and the Northeast and Northwest. Um, uh, there are growing strains and growing violence uh, uh, there. So we have, we have extremists in every group. And only when we stand together against this, both the, the secular entities of democratic interfaith community standing up from each other, um, uh, can we do that? And when we stand together on these things, we're modeling the very kind of world that we are trying to um, that we are trying to create. So this is a crucial battle for us. And I really hope that part of the agenda of working for peace uh, in, in here in the United States will really improve, include this kind of, um, uh, this kind of uh, effort here. Um, uh, here, we are clearly running out of uh, time on this, but to the religiously oppressed in every land who live in fear, afraid to speak, publicly of what they simply believe because they may be charged with blasphemy who worship in underground churches and mosques that's authority to discover and punish their devotion who languish in prisons tortured um bodies broken spirits equally disfigured simply because they love god in their own way or question the existence of god who feel so desperate that they flee their homes to avoid killing and persecution because of their faith for all of them i hope that america will remain a beacon of hope and fight in the freedom for all such people. And I'm proud of having been a small part of that over these past 20 years and urge all of you 
to find ways to reach out in your own communities to the diaspora communities of those facing that oppression in China, in Russia, in India, in Pakistan, in Africa, in countries in Africa, wherever it happens across the globe. Thank you so much, Rabbi Saperstein. You've uh, hit, you hit a home run again. Second outstanding presentation to our uh, supporters today, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, there were a few questions in the end that came up uh, regarding your first uh, section about the climate catastrophe or climate crisis, and I'd mm -hmm. like to read those. We're going to also cover a lot more ground on that with the next speaker, but uh, uh, thank you for your whole presentation. So here's the first question. Have faith institutions been missing in action from urging its, their staff and congregations to respond to climate change? Why is this and how can we change that? You know, I, I, I don't want to give a misimpression. I think Overwhelmingly, the houses of worship in the United States and clergy in the United States have spoken about the climate crisis, have implemented some practices in the way that their community and their institution works that make a difference. I'm just saying that I don't think that we have come close to having the T seesaw tip and I don't underestimate the good that moving from the edge of the seesaw towards the center um, uh, uh, does and, and really helps um, uh, here. But we've not tipped the seesaw to make this a, an intuitively priority issue for the religious communities of the world or of America. There are many wonderful individual exceptions to that. But as a community as a whole, of the 80% of the world's population who the polls tell us ascribe to, to, to identify with a religious practice, with a religious community, with a religious belief system. Um, uh, here, I don't think there's any question that facing the kind of crisis that we are facing that demands action at this time and which if we fail everything that God has entrusted us to take care of, will end up being destroyed. Um, I don't think we're nearly where we need to be. Thank you. And then another one is how can we get human beings to overcome the three impurities of greed, anger, and ignorance? And the person goes on to say human behavior is the cause of all the destruction of the natural world. It is, you know, ironically, religion is brought, one of religion's great gifts to moral thinking is an obligation that we have to generations yet unborn, generations yet to come um, uh, here. And, you know, we need to raise that voice more clearly than ever. We need to raise the voice, you know, I've testified a number of times before, so then uh, different committees on the House and Senate side or um, uh, uh, to a select committee on the, for instance, on the Endangered Species Act, or why we need to ensure that in any climate change legislation we pass, um, we have to take care of the poor. That is the poor countries across the globe who did the least to create the climate crisis um, uh, uh, here are least equipped to adapt to new technologies, least equipped to mitigate the damage being done um, uh, uh, by, uh, by this, are the most vulnerable. Um, and yet, for a long time, they were abandoned. Um, uh, they, we would raise this issue, often driven by the religious communities at the COP conferences. This one really did address it in a way, and I hope uh, perhaps Bill McGivens' message will contain something on that um, uh, here but it didn't really move the mark, but at least it identified this as a huge crisis. But it was true also within our own communities here in America, um, in cleaning up toxic waste dumps in, in the United States. Often, they disproportionately affect the poorest communities that are unable to do anything on their own and are often the last to actually have it taken care of, uh, efforts are being prioritized um, here. And we have to stand for that. And I'm proud of the fact you talk about what we can do. 
um, that at local levels where we're dealing with environmental issues, um, at state levels and at the federal level, religious communities really have gotten together to make the argument that we have to ensure that the kind of resolution of this affects all of our communities in a, a, here under the authority of that government, that governmental sovereign um, here in an equitable manner and doesn't benefit the rich communities before the poor communities, doesn't uh, deal with the health impacts with people who are wealthy enough to get health care and leave those who have been, uh, whose lives have been devastated by environmental health problems um, and uh, uh, here, betwixt and between. Um, here, we're really doing a good job, but can you imagine if every church and synagogue and mosque and temple and every religious leader were to make that argument here, we can transform the debate here. And uh, it is really important uh, that we act together uh, at this point. Thank you so much much Rabbi Seperstein. We deeply appreciate your second presentation for our constituency today at this afternoon's uh, conference. I'm going to move on now to, as I said, Bill McKibben had planned to be with us from Egypt, but his travel plans changed, and so he has sent a recording. Let me just say a few words of introduction about him before Jen plays that for us. A major figure in the climate justice movement. Uh, by the way, that's a that's a term that we're hearing more and more, especially coming out of Egypt now. The issue of climate justice. Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to the New Yorker and a founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of sixty to work on climate and racial justice. He founded the first global grassroots climate campaign, 350.org, and serves as the Schumann Distinguished Professor in residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. Uh, 